Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 267, recorded on November 16th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with the release of Fedora 37, with GNOME 43, and now official support for the Raspberry Pi 4. And you know that caught my attention. The work to officially get Fedora on the Pi 4 has been going on for a number of years. And I think one of the main issues was the lack of accelerated graphics. So with V3D now upstream and included in Fedora 37, that problem has been solved. So I gave it a go recently on my Pi 400. And that's the one that's a Raspberry Pi built into the keyboard. And even though I was using a USB thumb drive, so I, you know, load times for some applications aside, I still was seeing some of the best performance on a Pi yet. The GTK interface just really felt like I was on a standard desktop. The elements, when you click them, the way the windows draw, really snappy. I think the Fedora project has really delivered here. This release of Fedora is also shipping enhancements to wired networking on the CM4. And as you said, Chris, accelerated graphics using the V3D GPU for both OpenGL ES and Vulkan which is probably making the biggest impact on the performance that you're seeing there. Now, there are a few caveats that people should be aware of. Yeah, the biggest one for me was Wi-Fi on the Pi 400 is still considered, quote, out of scope for 37's release. It is waiting on firmware to be upstreamed from the vendor, which at this point is really kind of an unknown. So you'll have to use the Ethernet port on the Pi 400. Another thing to be aware of that also bites us, only the official CM4 I.O. board is supported right now. Other carrier boards should work, but that's going to depend on the particular vendor's implementation. And to keep things in the theme with the broader 37 release, hardware-based media decoding for H.264 is out of scope for this release. So you just got to keep those caveats in mind when picking an OS for your Pi 4. But with those aside, I think this already makes a pretty compelling development workstation for anyone working on an IoT platform or developers that are targeting ARM servers. And if some of those dependencies land upstream, you could really see that list of caveats getting smaller pretty quickly. The 37 release also saw the project officially add two new additions. Fedora Core OS and Fedora Cloud is back. Yeah, okay, so Fedora Core OS, that probably rings a bell. That's a successor to what you might even remember as Atomic Host, perhaps. And as you've probably guessed, it provides automatic Atomic updates with rollbacks, and it's really focused at container-based workloads. And the Cloud Edition, well, that provides a Fedora base to run in public or private clouds. In fact, AMIs will be available in the AWS Marketplace later this week, and the community channels are available now. On the desktop side of things, Fedora Workstation ships GNOME 43 with the latest and greatest version of the GTK Toolkit. And Firefox's language packs, well, they've finally been split into sub-packages, keeping things leaner and meaner. If you'd like more, well, don't worry. We did a complete review in Linux Unplugged 484. Well, nothing makes us feel more awkward in the free software community than talking about the great work over at Facebook slash Meta. And this week, they're finally announcing Sapling, a new Git-compatible source control client. In the announcement, they acknowledge how critical Git and other distributed version control systems have become to modern development workflows. In fact, Sapling started life as an extension to the Mercurial version control system, before eventually growing into what Meta describes as a scalable, user-friendly tool over the past 10 years. Here's where they kind of zero in on the goods in the announcement. They say, quote, Sapling is a source control system used at Meta that emphasizes usability and scalability. Git and Mercurial users will find that many of the basic concepts are familiar, and that workflows like understanding your repository, working with stacks of commits, and recovering from mistakes are substantially easier. When used with our Sapling-compatible server and a virtual file system we hope to open source in the future, 
Sapling can serve Meta's internal repository with tens of millions of files and tens of millions of commits and tens of millions of branches. I can't believe it, but it's apparently already that time of the year. Google has kicked off the 2023 Summer of Code program. It's the 19th consecutive year of funding open source development over the summer. And Google says they've reviewed the feedback from the 2022 program, and they're going to make some tweaks for next year. Seems like up first is increased flexibility in the project lengths. Instead of a set 12 weeks for everyone, they're now going to allow a 10 to 22 week range. They also have more options for the project's time commitments, and in another big change, expanding beyond students and making the program available to anyone new to open source development. That seems like a big deal and a great addition to the Google Summer of Code program. It could potentially open this up to many more open source projects. So if you're interested in applying for the program, we'll put a link in the show notes. Checking in on the progress of Rust landing in the Linux kernel, with the initial Rust infrastructure support landing in Linux 6.1, the next obvious question is, when should we expect complete support? Well, this past Thursday, Miguel Oyeda, leading the Rust for Linux effort, sent out a set of 28 patches. Miguel writes in the patch notes, quote, This patch series is the first batch of changes to upstream the rest of the Rust support. That, combined with everything else already in Linux Next, well, could mean seeing full Rust support ready for the 6.2 merge window next month. Though, I don't know if I'd bet my sats on that. Linode.com slash land. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and it's a great way to support the show. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Real humans all day, every day. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that want to lock you into their platform and give you all these crazy upsells constantly. On top of that, Linode has better performance. They've got 11 data centers today. They're adding a dozen more next year. And they have great features like object storage, cloud firewall, backups, Kubernetes support, Terraform, Ansible, <laughs> all of that and more. Linode is what we use. You're going to love it. So go to linode.com slash LAN. Get that $100 in 60-day credit. Kick the tires for yourself and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. And also, thank you to Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that uses the most powerful untapped resource in IT, end users. When you're trying to achieve security goals, whether for a third-party audit or for your own compliance standards, the conventional wisdom is to treat every device like Fort Knox. Old-school device management tools like MDMs force disruptive agents onto employee devices that slow performance and treat privacy as an afterthought. And that way of doing things turns IT admins and end users into enemies and creates its own security problems because users turn to shadow IT just to do their jobs. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team when their devices are insecure and give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve the problem. By reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide can help you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. For IT admins, Collide provides a single dashboard that lets you monitor the security of your entire fleet, whether they're running on Mac, Windows, or Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disk encrypted, OS is up to date, and password manager installed, making it easy to prove compliance to your auditors, customers, and leadership. So, that's Collide. User-centered, cross-platform, endpoint security for teams that slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Visit collide.com slash LAN 
to find out how. If you follow that link, I'll hook you up with a goodie bag, including a t-shirt, just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. Today as we record, Microsoft has released version 1.0 of the Windows subsystem for Linux. Now, to be clear, this is the 1.0 of WSL 2.0. So it's 2.0's 1.0. What's confusing about that? Absolutely nothing at all. That's just par for the course for Microsoft. But here's a quick little timeline of the history of WSL. Six years ago, way back on August 2nd, 2016, WSL saw its initial release. Now, this was WSL version 1, which relied on some fancy Windows kernel translation layers to emulate the Linux kernel API. That worked pretty well, but there were some problems that the translation layer approach just couldn't really resolve. So then, three years later, June 12th, 2019, the first version of WSL 2 was released. This was transitioned from running that translation layer to instead running a full-blown, real Linux kernel in a hypervisor. And that is what got us to today, November 16th, 2022, and the 1.0 release of WSL 2.0. Yeah, and, you know, 2.0's 1.0 is not really a big significant release in terms of features. The release log includes three relatively minor changes, I suppose you could say, uh, one of which is literally just the removal of the preview label. But in doing so and hitting this milestone, it means that WSL is now generally available to all Windows Store users. That's a pretty big change for the public. If you weren't already nerdy or curious enough to go poking around and enable extra settings to get access to it, it, it means now that WSL is just generally available to a whole bunch more Windows users. I've got to think that's kind of a good thing. Looking at the heart of WSL, it's powered by Linux kernel 515. But with Linux 6.1 now in the late RC stage, and 6.1 being slated to be the next LTS release, well, one can likely surmise that WSL 2 will be rebased on 6.1 sometime next year. Yeah, that is a little bit of a wait. Um, but, you know, I think something like WSL, uh, you know, ideally the 1.0 release is not some big earth-shattering release. It should be safe and stable. That's what a 1.0 should be. And if you look back at the development cycle, it does seem like a lot of the last really big changes to WSL they landed in like the 0 0.7 release cycle. And since then, with all of the subsequent releases to this point, it seems that Microsoft's really just been trying to work out the kinks and smooth things out. And, you know, on the kernel, something tells me that WSL users probably don't care that much about the specific kernel version. As long as the functionality to make their WSL work and whatever app that they need to do work is there, I think they're probably happy. But it does have me wondering how usable it all is now. Kind of makes me think that maybe you and I should give Windows 11 an honest try, you know? Put WSL 2.0 on there, 2.0, 1.0, of course. Get the new terminal. Maybe the audience could recommend a package manager. Really, anything the audience could recommend to make it a usable experience. But you and I load it up and see if we can't make it a workstation that meets our requirements as Linux users. I'm a little hesitant for what I'm about to agree to, um, but yeah, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> it probably would be a good idea to get an update on on what that experience is like. I know we both tried it, both Windows 11 and WSL2, but I haven't used either of them in ages, let alone together. I do need to clarify, though. I, for one, I do care what version my kernel is. Yeah, that's going to be a point of pride, you know, midway into next year when they're still on 5.15. And we've got, like, rust and all of that kind of good goodness in our kernels on our modern systems. We'll be like, well, if you weren't on WSL. Um, <laughs> I actually kind of have the sense that this 1.0 for 2.0 is not the only WSL news, maybe even this week. I'm not sure. It seems that Microsoft has some more in store. One of the Microsoft program managers for WSL, Craig Lowen, he tweeted right around when we started recording that they have some, quote, other exciting news coming very soon in regards to 
the Windows subsystem for Linux. So we'll keep an eye on that and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source news. So the best thing you can do is go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get our new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know what kernel you're running. Did we miss a story this week? Boost in with a new podcast app from newpodcastapps.com and tell us what you'd like to hear us cover. And you'll hear it when we're back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. 